Thanks for listening to another episode of the Gift of Performance podcast. If you're listening or watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, as well as hitting the like button and the notification bell so you never miss a video. If you prefer audio format, search Gifted Performance on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting service and subscribe today. Make sure you also rate and review the podcast as that helps us out tremendously. Enjoy the podcast and stay gifted. Welcome back, guys. Another episode of the GPP, the Gifted Performance Podcast, where we give you the knowledge and practical takeaways to improve your own general physical preparedness. We're going to have a lot of GPP talk today with our esteemed guests. Before I intro him, and I did some research on LinkedIn before, so I got the full intro ready, Coach Storms. We're going to check in with Dr. Mike Taylor. Doc, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing uh, doing wonderful. Give us in 140 characters or less, how your experience has been closing on your home? Uh, chaotic. Very, <laughs> very chaotic. Um, yeah, no, it's been a very chaotic experience, but we're almost done. Um, I wouldn't he, recommend he it. made it. He yeah. sees the light on the other yeah. side. <laughs> and the other gentleman that is on the camera is Coach Storm. So Coach Storms, for those who do not know, is the head strength coach at Florida State University, master strength conditioning specialist, which is, I believe, as high as the NSCA hierarchy runs. There is no step higher. It really just means that I've gotten really, really old in this business. It's probably the number one thing that means. But, uh, yeah, with the CSCCA, that is their kind of highest honor that they that they bestow. And I think in the last 20 years, there's probably been just over 200 guys that have been given that, that designation. So an elite crew. Coach Storms, you also played tight end at University of South Dakota in your younger years. I believe you, uh, and I had to read some deep forums way down the LinkedIn here. I believe you did some moonlighting in the NFL and you went under the name Tony Gonzalez. Is that true? I wish that was true. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> un- un- unfortunately, uh, USD back then is where they kept uh, – uh, under talented, tough guys that really like football that were probably not going to go much past there. Okay. Well, you know, can't re- can't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, so you went, spent some time with the Vikings, uh, spent some time at UNLV, a little bit of air as Arizona state. You were there at Arizona state for, I believe 10 years. Then you were at Memphis. I'm a UCF guy. So obviously getting your tail handed to you by, uh, the golden Knights. <laughs> and now you've, <laughs> and now you've uh, found your home at FSU with uh, Coach Norvell. Did I miss anything there? Nope. That's pretty much uh, that's uh, tw- 20 years in a, in a 10 second nutshell. 20 years in a synopsis. So when you first got into kind of physical culture as a whole, strength conditioning, football, just the nature of being physical, what what was that early story for you? Everyone's kind of got that inception story of getting into the sport, getting into lifting weights. What is that for you? Were you, you know, young kid in the basement with the 15 pound sandbags just doing curls? Was that your story like most? So it, for me, without even realizing, it probably started a long time before then. So when I was really, really young, we're talking uh, – before the age of seven, we lived in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, my mom was uh, huge into fitness. Uh, she worked in gyms, uh, you know, taught a, taught aerobics, all the, all that kind of stuff. And I went to the gym with her all the time. And you know, I didn't stay in daycare with the kids. I hung out with the guys that worked in the gym. So like, from five years old on, like I'd been around that and exposed to that. And then growing up, you know, I was as tall as I am now in like seventh grade. So. At 13 years old or whatever I was that age, I'm 6'4". So I was, one, thought I was going to the NBA. I was tr- dreadfully wrong on that. But I was always the t- I was always the tallest kid. And so that I, you know, loved sports, knew I was relatively athletic, but also knew that, like, without the weight room, I had no chance to do anything with any of it. So, you know, the weight room called my name at a pretty early age. And, you know, obviously that was long, long, long before the Internet. So you did spend a lot of years doing a lot of, a lot of stupid shit. And, uh, you know, learned, learned as you went and, you know, went on, like I said, you know, played it, played at USD, but then kind of, you know, knew I wanted to continue to be involved with the game. Always knew I wanted no business with being a football coach, but loved the game, loved being around it. And just because the way my career went, went, the way my path went that, I realized I was more passionate about the preparation to play the game, you know, the fight before the fight than I was about the game itself. And so that kind of just naturally you know, led me to this path. 
So when was your first exposure to working in strength conditioning? Did it start internship shortly after your time at USD? Did you get a part-time gig? Where did it all begin for you? Okay. So even when I was even uh, at USD, I was done, I was done playing early, uh, got in a car accident, had a, a, a cervical spine injury. Uh, so that, you know, ended, ended the playing career. Um, and so, you know, I worked in, I worked in some gyms there, uh, went, did an internship at a private facility in Sioux Falls, South Dakota one summer and not even really an internship for credit. I was just, I was like, I knew, I, I knew that's what I wanted to do trying to find some experience. There's only so many outlets for it, you know, in, you know, in the late nineties in, in South Dakota. And so went and worked for a guy there named Steve Bliss, uh, who I had no idea at the time was part of Boyd Epley's original crew from Nebraska. You know, he had been the first ever strength coach at Ohio state, um, a guy that kind of had been everywhere and done everything in this business at that point. It was kind of the tail end of his career, you know, transition out of the, the college chase and all that. And so that guy was a, was an outstanding mentor to me. Um, and then, you know, I knew I needed to do an internship for, you know, for credit to graduate and all that. And so once again, just uh, really and truly dumb luck, which has kind of happened a few times in my career, you know, just one, you know, volunteering at a gym and finding out the guy that's going to, I'm going to work for is a legend in the business. And then go to apply for an internship and with having no network and no one to tell me otherwise, I literally sent out two resumes and interviewed for two positions and got offered them both and, uh, probably on the day after Christmas and probably 19 would have been 99 or 2000 uh, took the position with Vikings. Batting a thousand, batting a thousand on applications. You don't see a lot of people that are, uh, that, that go that way. It's a, uh, it was, uh, it's, it's a... very much, it's very much Forrest Gump is what it is. <laughs> so I think, I think you've got a pretty, you, you've got a story that, that probably resonates with a lot of strength coaches. You know, it's, it's getting injured. It's, it's finishing with the sport early. It's, it's still wanting to be involved. And I think that's where people kind of hit this fork where they either go the, the S and C route, which is where you went, or they went the route or they go the route that Mike does like the injury working with injury route. Mike, do you have anything, any similar stories to that as to what kind of delineated your path to PT versus S and C? Did you ever want to go that route of strength conditioning? I actually did. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> for me, I, uh, like midway through college realized I didn't want to be just a, and not just a, but a communications major. I realized I wanted to do, uh, this whole like powerlifting thing. Cause I fell into the powerlifting team there at FSU was really interested in the research that, that Mike Sordos was doing with the team and stuff. So I was like, Oh, this is cool. You can just like study people lifting weights, but you know, kind of similar in, in that, you know, just sometimes like fate happens. Um, couldn't get into the program because I was like too far along um, credits wise. Like I wasn't going to graduate on time if I did that. And uh, the air force was like, no, you, you can't do that. Um, but you could just take random classes to, uh, you know, apply for PT school, like do the prereqs if you want to. And I figured, you know, I, I had had, you know, some back pains at the time and you'll watch the, you know, a little bit of mobility wad stuff figured, okay, that seems, seems cool. I, I could do that had no idea what I was getting myself into, but, you know, fortunately I think it turned out to be kind of like the, the right fit for me. So I, I totally resonate with that and that, you know, <clears throat> our initial plans, you know, don't always wind up the, the way that we foresaw them going, but you know, you kind of end up where you needed to be. So totally I, hear that. I'm, I'm laughing because my path was exactly the opposite of yours in some ways. Um, when I was younger, I really, really thought I wanted to go the PT route and by younger, like in high school, I'm like, that's what I want to do. And so through through our ortho doc there, I got a chance to go do some uh, some job shadowing uh, in a clinic with a PT. And uh, partially, I think it was probably the population that they were working with, and maybe just on that given day. But like, as we're helping this an, an older gentleman relearn to walk, and guy shits his pants out of the back of a <laughs> hospital gown and everything else, I'm like, nope, this nope, yeah. this one's not for me. I, I was wrong. Ain't I was it. wrong. So, so <laughs> let's let's figure out the next thing. But that, that's a lot, really, a lot of poop. Really what I thought I was gonna do. Yeah, it was a lot. There's a lot, a lot it's, that will, uh, yeah. that will uh, shape your, shape your future when you're 17 or 18 years old. Absolutely. I think that's how you kind of end up making an informed decision about like what you really jive with, what you want to do with and, and, and not. And strength conditioning is, you know, an inherently very nomadic occupation. You're, you're on the move all over the place. So coach storms, I'm interested to hear, um, your opinion here. What was, what was kind of your favorite gig along the line? I think a lot of people would look at that Vikings job and they'd be like, Holy crap. Like 
the the big boys, the pros right away, like that had to have been your favorite one. But was it? You know, it's it's different. Every place I've been has had some has had some really unique stuff. Like the Vikings deal was cool. Like, you know, growing up in South Dakota, family from Minnesota. I was born in Minnesota. That's obviously like that's a dream job. Right. And like the, the fall into that that early. I think in some ways, like I didn't know enough at that point to know how to maximize that opportunity. You know, at that point, I'm like, I'm going to show up every day. I'm going to work really hard. I don't know what else to do, you know? And so so there wasn't an opportunity to, to have uh, probably to have truly, truly maximized that. Had I had some more experience beforehand, I think that would have been a more valuable experience. Um, and then, you know, after that, I go to UNLV. And, like, there I'm working for Mark Philippi, who at that time was still competing in World's Strongest Man. And, you know, the, the different people, the circle of people that he was friends with that came and went for that place, you know, you're talking, you know, Magnus Samuelson. I mean, Ed Cohen taught me how to deadlift. Like, how cool is that? You know what I mean? Like, that's awesome. That's a very unique thing. And then, you know, you go to Arizona State. Now you're at a, at a higher level than I was at UNLV. And then, you know, that's where I got a chance to not be nomadic. You know, with that age in this business where most guys are making a move every year, every two years. I stayed there for 10 years, which was 11 seasons through, you know, four ADs, three head football coaches and three head strength coaches, you know, was able to, to sustain there throughout that time and able to elevate as time as time went, you know. And so just to have that experience of longevity in one spot, not just one spot, but just, you know, a phenomenal place to live and be and all those things. And then, you know, Memphis was awesome because that's a chance to to go there and, and to to run your own shop and all this, all the stuff you've thought about for years and all these ideas and opinions you had, you know, you get to go put them in action you know and the first thing you find out when you become the head guy is like you don't get to have an opinion anymore you gotta take action on everything you know and then you know and also going there you're, you're we followed up there at a time of like unprecedented success era of success so then the pressure there is like hey this has been as good as it's ever been like don't mess this up you know so you got to find a way to build on success and then we come here and we're kind of on the exact other end of the spectrum we're kind of at an unprecedented low point in program history so now it's on us to build and resurrect this thing get it off the ground and get it flying again and and every one of those has been awesome in its own unique way so it's very very hard to pick a to pick a favorite place you know it really is because each one was so different so unique and I'm sure a lot of that has has really molded you as a coach, has molded your philosophy. If I asked you in 2001 when you got the job with the Vikings, what is your coaching philosophy? It's probably a lot different than your answer would be today, right? Yeah, I mean, huge difference. I mean, especially in that example, uh, when I was there, like we were your very standard uh, 1980s into the 90s NFL program. It was, it was straight, you know, Arthur Jones high intensity. It was a room with hundred different hammer strength pieces and nautilus pieces and it's you know seven second rep one set of ten to failure you know 23 movements in a day and keep it moving you know uh pretty limited on the field work and the skill development the movement stuff there's very little of that you know so when that's your first experience you're like whoa this is not what we did in college at all i don't see a clean or squat or anything anywhere but this is the nfl so maybe this is just the way like you know so it, it it was it was awesome in that sense to see the the other side of the coin, so to speak, in training. You know, so I've got to kind of see it all across the board in in, in this time period. As you know, it's as the fitness and as the strength space has changed. It's like I, I love that you bring up Arthur Jones because that was such a pivotal time for Arthur Jones and Nautilus that like they were really pushing hard into the NFL space. So that kind of drove this chasm between what you saw at the collegiate level, like you said, and what you saw at the NFL level. So I'm sure you, I mean, your day to day now probably looks way different than what it is or than what it was back then. So for people on the outside looking in who don't know what a strength coach does, what do you do on a day to day basis? I think Mike said it's what Mike just hanging out with strong dudes and making dudes strong. Pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, 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 I wish it was that. And I'll tell you what, like, you, you know, we talk about what gigs your favorite. I tell my young guys all the time, whether it be interns for us, you know, places that we've had GAs, whatever, like you got to value that time in your career. Cause at yep. that point in your career, in a lot of ways, it's kind of what it is. There might be a little bit of cleaning every, you know, and mixed in there and, you know, some learning and reading and trying to figure out how to pay your bills, making no money. But like, that's really what you're doing. And then the further you get up the ladder from that, the more, the more tasks that get added onto that as well, you know? And so it's a little bit different here at Florida state. Um, cause I, cause 
our program separated between Olympic sports and between football. So I'm just I'm just over football. So it's myself, my four full time guys that work for me, and that's it. So that does streamline a lot of my day because I'm not overseeing the Olympic sports and all the additional coaches and relationships that go with that. You know, I have my main contact in sports medicine, my main contact with nutrition, and so my my day to day chain of uh, chain of communication is pretty uh, is pretty tight. Um, but you know kind of day to day it's interesting because it depends on what time of year it is and that's to me that's one of the best things about like my job is depending what month it is or what season of the year it is my entire lifestyle is completely different you know uh we're just coming off of our our discretionary time of year from the time the spring game ended up until now uh which this year because of covid not every spring break a lot of things go into it like it's been it's it's basically the guy's optional time of year. You know, classes are done. A lot of guys are headed home. You got a crew of guys still in town. It's a little, it's a little more casual time of year, you know? And so it's a very different environment. Well, come Tuesday when we're all back and the summer program starts, then everything changes, right? Now that the, the, the workload, you know, the battle rattle of your week is up, 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 you know, and that's going to be full tilt through the end of the summer before we report to camp. Um, you know, from there you transition out, you go into the season, you're there a ton for us. You know, our piece of the pie, the workload gets a lot smaller. You know, guys are getting three lifts in a week. Lifts are a little bit briefer in nature. You know, and after that, it's it's working with return to play guys. It's being at practice. Um, it's doing those things. And then, you know, you transition out of that. You get a little time off after after bowl season, and you come back and boom, you're right in the back of the middle of winter program, going through tour of duty, match drills, build up spring ball. You know, and then once again, you transition to spring ball. It's kind of like a in-season light. And then, boom, you're back into discretionary time again. You know, so the time of years really, really dictates kind of what my what my day to day looks like. You know, I guess you want to say it. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, as I say, just, you know, if you look at like Tuesday, once we start, so we'll go, you know, our first group of trains at 10 a.m. Um, you know, we'll be in the, we'll be there in the office pretty early because we'll meet in the morning as staff going over just the, the nuts and bolts of the day, any last minute stuff because the schedule will train in the morning. And then we'll have a group. Our first group today is at 10. Next one's 1230. Last one's at three o'clock. You know, those groups are going to last, you know, hour and 45 minutes, two hours between field work, weight room work. End of the day, we'll go back out, bring the whole team together, warm those guys up. They'll have uh, skills and drills with our football coaching staff, which is about a 30 minute period of like skill development, kind of like Indy would be at football practice. That's done. Those guys will throw for 30 minutes on their own, kind of seven on. That's the part the coaches can't be involved with. And then Tuesday's unique because when that when their section of seven on sevens over, then we'll condition as a team after that. Um, and we started doing that basically just because it's an opportunity to get more time on feet, get you a little closer to replicate a practice, get them out of the heat more as well. Um, and then that kind of just fits into our into our overall training week. So that's kind of when we do our general conditioning stuff. And then that that you know a different variation that's going to kind of repeat daily this time of year. And then now with recruiting opening back it up, now you're putting in meeting with kids on official visits, meeting with kids on unofficial visits on top of our normal staff meets and stuff throughout the week. So the day gets full fast. You know, I think on most days, if we're, if we're at work 12 hours, that's like a very, very normal day. It's not a long day. It's not a short day. That's probably like the norm. Yeah. So in any of your other, um, your previous posts, did you also, were you head of Olympic or did you ever have Olympic also on your, on your kind of, your docket, your, your list of responsibilities. Yeah. That's what I'm at Memphis. I oversaw everything. Um, Oof. we, we, we were able to hire a really good Olympic director. So to be okay. honest, the Olympic stuff didn't come across my plate a whole lot, just some stuff with some coaches here and there and this and that, but we were in separate facilities too. Um, and then, you know, you go back to Arizona state, um, you know, as an assistant, like the last, I know from 2012 on, I was football only, but from 2005 up to 2012, I always had Olympic sports. You know, I've, you know, I had track and wrestling and I mean, at one time or another over that longer period of time, like there's only a couple sports there that I did not train at one point or another. And like at UNLV, I think I had, I think I trained five Olympic sports along with, along with work and football. Yeah. And that's, and that's a workload that will drive any man up the wall right there. Oh, there, there's, there's no doubt, especially like, you know, my first year when I got to Arizona state, I think I was making, I made 24, five, my first year with full loaded teams, huge football responsibilities, the whole deal. And that's just, but that's what you do at that time. And a lot of guys are going, you know, I didn't get in this business to train this, that, or whatever Olympic sport, but you know, I'll tell guys all the time, you know, those guys that fall in those football only positions early on, that's a big disservice to them as a coach. 
because I always viewed, you know, whether I sit across the table from the women's soccer coach or water polo coach or our track coaches or whoever it was, like, I'm like, these are reps for later in life. Because someday I'm going to have to sit, I'm be sitting and having these conversations with the head football coach, right? And so all these programs I'm writing for these sports now, like someday I'm going to be told, hey, football is your deal. You got You are responsible for that. Well, if I've been in a football only position my entire career up until that moment comes, there's some guys that all of a sudden you find yourself, I'm the head strength coach. And then you realize I have never written a program for a team in my career. No, thanks. That, that's scary to me, right? Yeah, one chance to do it right, man. I want to get, I wanted to get as many coaching reps and relationship reps and conflict reps under my belt as I could possibly get before I had the job that I dreamed about having when I got into the profession. For sure. And I think, you know, when, you know, when NBC travels to Alabama and they do a walkthrough of their strength conditioning facility and, you know, it's their head strength coach and he's yelling and screaming and they got all the best equipment and all these, you know, phenomenal athletes and whatnot from the outside looking in, that's a very kind of, it looks like a very rewarding job, but there are some very unpleasant parts of the job what would you say are kind of top on your list there of those things that come across and you're like oh man not again you know some of it is the uh i mean i mean so you look at your roster you got 125 some odd kids from every different background you could ever possibly imagine and some from backgrounds you couldn't possibly imagine right and now here we are all in the same time at the same place trying to go for the same goal and you want to talk family and you want to say those things but you have a lot of guys who like they're like you tell them family. Well, they think about their family at home. They're like, coach, like but that that's not a very positive connotation. You know what I mean? And so it's 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 teaching guys how to be part of something larger than themselves. You know, it's also taking the guy who was raised in a super affluent background, you know, to have been raised a certain way to think they're a certain thing to realize like, hey, this is not all about you. There's there's more there's more going on here than just your path, and so it, what it is it's a melding of all those different backgrounds and trying to manage those things, you know, and then for stuff that comes up you're like man like here's here's the stuff they didn't tell you about you know, it's it's the it's the managing schedules it's the you know once again you got 125 guys trust me not every one of those guys loves to train. At the end of the day, though, if they're in our program, they are going to train. And we do our best to make our room and environment where those guys realize, like, this is an asset for me. This is a tool to make me better at what I do. But at the times when things, you know, don't go as planned and the guy's falling short in his end, then, then you got to handle that. You know what I mean? And so you, you do have to be very comfortable with conflict in this business. And it's kind of funny because some people are very averse to that. You know, in a lot of ways, though, I'll run towards that because oftentimes that guy that you have conflict with, if you if that's handled the right way and it has to be handled by you the right way as the you know the adult the grown man in the situation so to speak and you can double back and make that a learning thing sometimes that's been some of my biggest bonding moments and some of the guys I ended up being closer with than any other kid I coach you know um so there's there, there's uh there's a lot of stuff but to be honest the, the 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 positives and watching the maturation of guys and all those things outweighs sometimes the the tic tac day to day bullshit that you got to chase down and deal with. But for the most part, like, you know, if you look at it in the grand scheme of things and the, uh, uh, put a, put a filter on it, even the worst of my stuff ain't that bad. Mike, two part question coming at you. Get ready for it. Um, the first part is going to be our, our serious part here. <laughs> Do you see kind of like a similar parallel with the PT industry where like, as you kind of get, up in your current position and you manage more um more patients you have to deal with more of that stuff that you kind of dislike the 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 paperwork the day-to-day bs is that something that you kind of also have to deal with for sure yeah i mean and it's gonna be different in different settings right but generally once you've like worked as just a general like staff therapist at, at any place eventually you're gonna end up being like the director of the clinic or or what have you and so that's kind of the position that i was in for my last year um currently has been kind of as like a, uh, you know, basically clinic director type equivalent, right? And, and, and it, honestly, it's been not that hard because I have like a good team of people, but you definitely have to like uh, change your perspective from just the, being there to treat patients, you know, similar to, you know, you, you aren't there just to like teach the uh, clean and jerk. You're not there just to uh, write a program. It's all about like managing personalities, managing people, and, you know, kind of the stuff that comes along with that. Um, you know, I, I think the, the toughest part 
has, for, for me has always been having to like manage outside of my organization. So like, you know, talking with people who are um, outside of the PT clinic, you know, resolving conflict with them generally in house, it's a, uh, you know, not, not, it's not always easy, but it's always, I would say a lot more manageable. So, so definitely relatable. Um, and, and I, I kind of feel like it's probably relatable in, in a lot of different fields. It's just, you know, the higher you rise up, the less you do the thing you initially thought you were going to do, but the more that you have, I guess, a, uh, an impact on a bigger, um, net thing, I guess if that makes sense. You're kind of driving a team versus just yourself. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Part two. Okay. You guys fans of that show Last Chance You on Netflix? Did you guys watch absolutely, that show? Absolutely. Coach, you ever watch that show? I've actually never seen it. Oh, oh, man, you're missing out. So now you got something on Netflix to binge for the next Just time you have one and a little two. bit. You could, you, could, you could stop after seasons. So, like, yeah. They, they get when later, when but. when coach brought up like the affluent kid that you kind of have to like sit down and be like, hey man, like this this show ain't all about you. I thought of Mike. Do you remember Malik Henry, the quarterback? I think he I mean, actually ended up at Florida State too. He was at I mean, he was at Florida State for a time. Yeah, he was like a, a an elite kid. And you know, I, I'm I don't I don't know what he's doing or anything like that. So, uh, but definitely on on the show, if that's kind of where you're going, he had some like personality uh, conflicts that they had to deal with. I was just wondering at what the, happened uh, at him. the community college. Yeah, I have, I have no idea to be honest. Gone, um, gone into the ether. He's out there. Hopefully, doing well with whatever he's doing. Coach, yeah, you and, mentioned, you know, and one of the one of the one of the hardest things, really, you want to talk about like the things that are hard you don't expect is the uh, the managing, the setting of goals and the expectations, because that's one thing that's a little bit newer here at Florida State. You know, every kid has the dream of going to the NFL, right? But I think when you come to a place like this that helps you believe that you're going to make it a little bit more. But I think even harder, all the people who, are, who surround our kids outside of the building, friends, family, acquaintances, you name it. Oh, you're playing at Florida State. You're going to the league. And the amount of pressure it puts on these kids is insane. And helping them manage that for the ones that do have a chance to go and for the ones that you know, like, that's not your future, man. But you you can't crush that dream, but it's, there's management expectations and, uh, and the ups and downs that, that go, that go with that. And then sometimes even worse is when you get those guys where like, you see all the potential in the world when a kid, you see the talent, you see all these things, but you, you keep finding yourself back in the same place where you're wanting it more for them than they are. And you know, for them to be so easy to tap into it, access it, but they just don't want it. Yet, you know, when coach says, you know, who wants to go to the NFL? Boom, my well, hands go up. And you look at this guy, and you're like, hey, like, at some point, you got to look at the mirror as a man and be honest with yourself. Is that what you really want? Okay, if it's what you really want, then let's go chase that down. Let's go get it. Because it's not just going to happen because you raise your hand because you want to, and you think the NFL is going to fall in your lap. The amount of guys out there that are that talented that, that happens to is pretty damn slim. You know, and so that's one of the tough battles we, we continuously fight is like, getting guys to build that confidence in themselves to go actually chase down that dream for real and not be afraid of failing at that dream because of all the people around them. How much, how much more challenging is reframing that discussion today than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, because now I can look online and I can tell you the top 100 12 year old, you know, boys football players. And they're being told from the time they're 11, 12 years old, like, you're going to the league. So by the time they come through your door, they've already had six years, seven years of being told you're going to the NFL. How hard does that discussion become when it just ain't happening? Yeah, and, that, and that's a tough part because you would think because all the information is so accessible that you can easily and then all the met, you know metrics of being able to stack yourself up against the guys that are actually going. You think it'd be really easy for a guy to be like, man. I don't look like that or I can't run that or I'm not putting up those stats, but it's not the case. Cause once you get on the other side, you get the social media end. You could have one person telling you like, listen, man, like you're a fringe guy, you're a free agent at best, whatever it may be. And you're, you're coming to them for a place of, of honesty and a long time of experience. And you've seen it all play out a million times and you're giving them good information. Well, all it takes is a handful of, pe of, their, of people on Twitter or Instagram, like, yeah, you're going to be a first rounder. You're the, you're the GOAT. You're this, you're that. And I'm like, it's really, really easy to pick and choose and curate the information you want to buy into. You know? And once again, like you would think that, like, uh, Mike, we've talked before about some of the messages on Twitter with the recruiting stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, you guys, I don't know if you've been able to see this, but this came across tonight 
I don't know how well you're going to see that. Oh, I, I saw that earlier. Yes. Yep, yep. We're ready for ninth grade. Yeah. Once again, if I'm a kid and I see that and I'm working my ass off and I'm that kid's age, I'm like, yeah, maybe this isn't for me. You know, but... <laughs> You know, I felt like that. Got, I'm, a, I'm a grown man, and I felt like that. I was like, oh. "There's no question. There's no question." I mean, what was uh, the staff? What were the stats you, there? What was he like? Six five, two sixty, something like that. Yeah, in like eighth grade. You know, we oh. had the, you know, the staffs out right now doing all those youth camps around the state for kids that are from second to eighth grade because we can't with recruiting. They have, we can't have contact with them to be older yet until June first. But uh, I got sent a picture from one of the uh, camps in the southern part of the state, and. Uh, there's a there's a, a young man standing next to our tight ends coach, who is pretty close to my height, and he's probably I don't know two thirty ish. You know, he's a good sized guy, and this kid absolutely dwarfs him. And this kid's like six eight and like two hundred ninety pounds. His voice hasn't even changed yet. Oh my god! I mean, it, and once again, like that's that's unbelievable. You know, so. Try to tell guys all the time, man, just because you work hard does not guarantee you anything. The only thing hard work guarantees you is that you'll have a chance to get your foot in the door. But you see stuff like that, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Keep working. I think that segues nicely into, like, when when you as a strength conditioning coach are looking at metrics for guys on your team and saying, you know, this guy is going to make it at the next level. Are there any specific metrics that you look at? I read an article, I don't even know, it must have been like three or four years ago that looked at, you know, a correlation between 1RM deadlift and 40-yard dash. And this guy said, you know, I can tell you by the 1RM deadlifts that these programs have collected, who's going to run the four- fastest 40-yard? I think he did it on like 12 people. And I was like, great, awesome sample size, dude. Way to pick and choose the ones that are going to prove your point there. But are there, are there any specific metrics that you look at where you're like, you know what, this this dude might be a bad man one day? You know, it, it, it's really tough, man. You can, you can look at the measurables and, you, you know, whatever your, pro, you know, your key performance indicators, whatever you want to look at. And at the end of the day, when it comes to a guy truly making it in the NFL, man, most of that does not matter. Because you'll have your guy that is your, you know, physical prototype maybe that guy doesn't have the mental makeup to do it and he falls short you'll have the guy that maybe physically is pretty fringe probably doesn't have a good chance to make it because they're wired the right way they go and they make it they're successful and the hard part is you can't really uh it, it's that's the hardest part there is to measure is the, is the mind and the mental makeup. You know, you know, we've had companies come in that have helped us with like some uh, how guys process mentally and learn and things like that. But like at the end of the day, it comes down to like, you know, what's what's the the level of uh, you know grit and toughness and consistency and internal motivation that's in a guy that lots of times is going to be the indicator of whether he makes or not. Because we've all seen a million guys that should have made it and didn't. And, oh, how could he not? He he ran this and jumped that. And, yeah, it wasn't in him, you know, and you hear those, you know, those stories in the NFL about those guys who were, you know, free agents or late round draft picks from a small school, weren't recruited, and someday they're putting a gold jacket on. You're like, how did that happen? They missed him. No, that guy was just wired differently than the rest of them, you know, and so if we ever figure out a way to, to figure that out, the three of us, then we're going to be just fine in life if we can figure out a way to identify that. So there's our project. Yeah. When we hang up the call here, we're going to start working that. We're going to pull an all night right tonight. <laughs> you haven't slept in over a week, so we might as well just keep the trend going and yeah. try and become billionaires tonight. <laughs> Mike, a question for you on more of the long-term athlete development side of things. When when you talk about the mental side of things, the IQ of the game, do you see starting earlier being beneficial? So early specialization versus more of a broad range of exposures being better for an athlete long term. So I probably don't have the same, um, <clears throat> you know, experience with, uh, you know, working with athletes across a, uh, a, a, a lifespan or, you know, even just a, a short number of years, but, you know, definitely all of the, uh, all of the research would indicate that early specialization, at least from like an injury standpoint, um, be pretty, pretty catastrophic. And you try to kind of have like a broad based, uh, approach at least early on. And then, you know, maybe later you specialize, I'd be interested to, to hear your thoughts on that coach. I mean, if you think, I mean, you know, it may, maybe like, you know, having like seven on helps with like football because they're not just like beating the hell out of each other all the time. And there are maybe some different skills that can develop, but I've, you know, everything that I've read has suggested that, you know, it's, it's, it's good to have, you know, you can play some football, you play some, 
some basketball, um, do do some different sports too, at least earlier on in life and then specialize. Yeah, I think I think early specialization is awful for kids because, e- OK, even if you have a kid who right, I'll use my son, for example, he's seven. Right. And wants to do every sport known to man. But this kid can throw a ball unlike any seven year old kid you've ever seen in your life. So a kid like that, you're going to have some families like he's going to pitch or he's he's going to be the next Peyton Manning. And so they try to protege that kid and make him specialize at seven years old before the kid even knows what they want to do. And so those are the kids that end up like burning out or they're so programmed that that leads to problems down the road. Or you just flat out just wear them out of the repetitive nature of what it is they're doing, you know. And I think I think kids need to play different sports because, one, it's different. You're, you're developing different traits of athleticism in, in all of them. You're staying motivated to play the one that you really love when you know you got to wait until, you know, football, baseball, basketball, whatever season starts, you're motivated, you're excited for that. Whereas, you know, if basketball is your deal, hell, you're playing or baseball is your deal anymore. Like that's a year round thing. It never stops. I don't care how much you love it as a kid. At some point, I really feel like you're like, man, I'm I'm not feeling this like I used to, you know? And then I think what you really got to look at when you were playing the same sport all the time, now you're talking about, you know, repetitive overuse injuries in kids that should never have those injuries. You know, and especially with the kids that are throwing athletes and stuff like that. And that's that's the only thing you do with them for so many years. I think it's a, a terrible path to go down, you know, and then, you know, you can't, you know, you look at, uh, you know, especially like like youth football. You know, you see all the kids coming in with uh, with spondy fractures that happened when they were kids. Well, the reason why is the equipment, those little tiny kids, those little 70, 80 pound kids are hitting is the same stuff our guys use. They're 250 pounds. No wonder they got back problems. You know what I mean? The helmet they use doesn't weigh a whole lot less than our guys' helmets, except their necks are the size of my cup, you know? And then you wonder why there's con- concussion issues and stuff like that. So I think with you sports, I mean, I think you, you I think you have to diversify. I think you got to really think long-term, long-term with, with, with the kids. And then also, like, for me, it's like I'm not going to – just because I love something, I'm not going to push my agenda or my love for that on my kid. Trust me, I'm going to make him be involved with stuff, but whatever that stuff is, that's going to be of – of his choosing. And right now it's awesome. Cause it's all mainstream sports. And that's cool, but it may not always be that. And you got to be okay with that too. And with, with the overuse side of things, I think there's been a lot of very positive education there in the past couple years of, you know, making your kid throw 400 pitches a week at their youth league, probably not the best thing for his elbow, his shoulder long term. So we've definitely kind of rounded the bend there on education, on the coaching and the parents side, or we are rounding the bend. I should say we're not all the way around yet. And I would say that I've noticed a positive trend on like movement quality over the last decade as well, except for LeBron James's squats. Absolute atrocity. We're throwing him out, throwing that baby out with the bathwater on this one. But overall, movement quality has improved over the past couple decades. I'd like to hear kind of your personal opinion on what you chalk that up to. Better coaching, more exposure to these movements early on. What is it for you? Um, I will say this, though. We can talk about LeBron James and squats all we want. But we are talking about a guy who's a billion-dollar athlete that's been in the league for 20 years who's still willing to put a bar on his back. Yeah, and, yeah. That al- that, and that alone, no matter what happens under that bar from that point, that still puts him ahead of the vast majority of of his peers. So somebody can work on the technique on that, but the fact the guy still wants to get his hands in a barbell and put a bar on his back, man, I'll, I'll, I'll take it because that's better than not. That's I'd a job for that you, than- Coach. You're LeBron's new guy. No, I don't know about that, but, um, you know, I, I think, I think with the progression and that other stuff, though, I think it's because like, there is so much more information out there. You know what I mean? And if I'm in a gym or I'm training kids or I'm coaching a team and it, whatever it is that I'm doing is awful, it's pretty hard for me to ignore that it's awful when I can just open my phone and scroll or flip open my laptop and see it done a million different ways all over the world and be like, Oh, all that looks better than what I'm doing. Okay, what are they doing? You know, and even if it's simply just copying things and you don't know why, well, better's better, you know. And and I think you, you see that with kids all the time. Um and so I think you get that the you get better skill development because there's not there's not secrets anymore. Like we talked earlier about being in, in in the NFL at that time with the high intensity and how different that was. Well, that's also back when strength coaches had secrets. Like, man, what's 
what's Nebraska doing? Or what's Penn State doing? Or what's so-and-so? What's Florida State doing? And no one knew because no one ever saw what's inside those walls unless you were there. And back then, even if you had a coach who would let you come site visit and, you know, they give you a copy of their program, a lot of times it wasn't the program they did there. It was just something generic they would give you to not share with you what they were actually doing because there were secrets. And so whatever you're doing in your walls, you could believe you're getting an unfair advantage over the rest of the country. And in some cases, teams probably were because it was such a new profession. But now anymore, I mean, hell, we all – there is no secrets. It's become way more homogenous because we all share, we all see, we all soak up, we read the, read the similar research, we go to the similar clinics, we share stuff. Hell, I'll have us posted on Instagram for everybody else to see too, you know? And so because of that, the program has become much more alike. Well, I think that, that trickles all the way down too, whereas, well, everybody has all this information, so now the information starts to pass around, and then it just becomes, starts to become who's the better practitioner and implementer and motivator of those things. But everybody's doing a lot of the same stuff, just how are they doing it? Yeah. So like on that point, I can recall even as recently, like, like you said, over the past like 10 years, I can recall seeing videos of like pros doing, you know, you know, lifts and, and you know, pros are pros. So, you know, I'm, I'm not here to like criticize, but, you know, with like not good form. Right. But then, and, and you know, obviously maybe it's just because it's the highlights, but you know, I've seen videos of of y'all guys, um, like, you know, when you guys were doing your uh, winter camp and stuff and you had, you know, freshmen coming in who, you know, new to college strength conditioning. So it's not like you've had them for four years at this point uh, with some pretty, pretty impressive lifts, actually. I'm not going to like name names or anything, but you know, it's, it's, it's cool to see it. Like they're getting that early start. Whereas, you know, before, like maybe even pros didn't have that back 10 years ago. So it'll be cool to see just like, you know, what, you know, are there like these new limits that are just going to be like untapped because now we have these like, you know, freak 16 year olds who are going to be coming in ready instead of like learning. So it's cool yeah, to see. I and I think with that, too, you look at like high school kids and trust me, the more kids we can bring in as freshmen that can clean 400 pounds, the better strength coach I look like. So let's just keep doing that. <laughs> I like it. Um, but, you know, you see you see like some of the numbers these kids are moving at young ages. And I think a lot of that that comes down to being talk about how bad social media is and this and that. But like if I'm a kid and I'm into lifting and I start scrolling through and I see Travis Mash's kids and what the numbers they are putting up at their Olympic lifts and things like that. Well, now, like I'm like, well, shit. I'm 17 like that kid. I can do that. You know, whereas if you go back to my age at 17, you'd look around your gym and whoever the strongest guy in the gym was, that's the strongest guy in the world. And whether that guy squatted 400 pounds or 700 pounds, like that, that change that, that would change everything for you in that setting, you know? And so you, that was what you inspired me to the strongest guy. Well, if the strongest guy is not very strong, then your bar is low. If I start scrolling around the internet now and you're seeing, thousand pound benches and thousand pound deadlifts and you're seeing some of these numbers put by kids that are 16 17 years old and some of those uh, you know elite type kids well now if i'm a kid i'm like that can be done it's like the four minute miles roger bannister you know what i mean no one had touched that number in the history of time and then when he did it it was broken like i don't know what it was 30 40 more times in the 12 months after he did it because the, the 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 bar had changed and people realized that you can and like we talk about our kids, man, that's the power of belief. And for us, yeah. like it's not just building muscles, it's trying to build confidence. How do I get that kid to build confidence and belief in himself to believe that he can go do it? He can be the one. That's the hardest part about our job. Being guys strong is the easy part. Yeah, I think that it's one of the, the funnest parts or one of the, the funnest thought experiments there of the field is like how far can we actually go? We had a another strength coach who's who's local to me in, in Melbourne, Florida, come on and he was like I think guys are going to throw 120 mile an hour fastballs. He's like, the possibility is there. Like people can do these things. And with exposure to high quality strength conditioning at a younger age, it's like, wait, maybe we really are just tapping, tapping the potential here. Maybe we're just, just seeing a, the tip of the iceberg on what these kids, what these are, are going to be capable of. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's hundred percent true. I mean, you know, and people are like, Oh, 120 miles. There's no, I mean, Okay, say that if you want now. And I'm, no one's saying it's going to happen this year, but just like the four-minute mile. People thought that would never happen. It was impossible. You'd burst into flames or go back into time if you broke four minutes. Let alone, a dude breaks at four minutes, and then it continues to go. And now you look how young of athletes are breaking four-minute miles. It's changing. Just like that kid I showed you in that, in that tweet. Like, it's, we, we, as a, we as a species are changing. And so will all those other things along with it. 
Yeah, something Just interesting a little different. Yeah. along the yeah. endurance side is like, I wonder now that the two hour marathon has been broken, how many people we're going to see start to break that barrier? Because that was something much like Roger Bannister that was like, that's impossible. It, it simply cannot be done. And yeah. now that it's until, been done. Until it is. Until it is. Until it is. I, could, I, could, I couldn't ride a bicycle that far in two hours. No, <laughs> no. I don't have the interest to do that. Um, Mike, on the injury prevention side of things, it, this is obviously going to take some time. to. We're going to need to allow time to protract out to see these benefits long term on injury rates. But do you see this increase in movement quality, this increase in resiliency through high quality resistance training at a younger age benefiting? in terms of injury rates or are we going to create such super freaks that when they collide their entire bodies are just going to explode oh man that's a that's a tough question and you know probably one that would be you know extremely nuanced so without just saying you know it depends right like i think like i need a yes or a no that's it yes yes (laughs) Um, yeah no i I, i'm pretty sure that you know the the consensus of the the evidence suggests that you know like resistance training has you know a protective effect on pretty much all individuals who who do it um but yeah i mean then you gotta think about like the workloads of uh of training or recovering appropriately and then just like the randomness of like these kinetic sports to some of that stuff you can't really account for and you know that's definitely a risk i guess if we're you know just let's let's think about acls or whatever um you know if, if people just keep getting uh stronger and faster or whatever and you know they uh get to the point where they they can run really fast but the second they you know plant to cut their their knee doesn't uh want to go along with it then you know maybe we see something like that but i i don't think we could responsibly say whether it would have a uh you know a positive or negative effect um but i do think it's awesome and we should absolutely keep doing it and see what happens what I, i'd be happy saying, to be wrong what you're I'd saying is we're gonna fuck later. around and find out that's right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll own that one if we're wrong later. Like, we never should have lifted that much. <laughs> it was a mistake. A <laughs> oh, shoot. So, Coach, earlier on in the podcast, you mentioned kind of the implications of COVID this year kind of still lingering around. I'd be interested to hear kind of what last year was like for you as a strength coach in kind of we'll just call it the year of COVID. How? How did things in your day-to-day life change? I mean, okay, so, okay, look at it like this. So we got here and, you know, uh, we started January 7th on 2020 here with our first winter program. Okay, so we got through eight-week winter program, you know, just getting to know these kids, you know, just barely, barely starting to roll out a very basic level of what we do training-wise. You know, we get into spring ball, we get through three practices. Now we're up to spring break, which is over like a – St. Patrick's Day during sometime during that week. And in that team meet in the morning before cut the guys loose, like things are moving really fast. Like there was a lot of shit going on. There's like, I think we're getting shut down. Why? Why would you know like you're just you're just starting to hear about stuff happening, right? And so we had that meeting where like, you know, and the the message changed like minute to minute all the way up to the meeting. So we just had to go on just like everybody just here's the information we have now. We have to act on this. And you know, so we told the guys, oh, you know, we're going for spring break. We'll probably be shut down for a couple of weeks. Make sure you take enough stuff with you. You know, if you're leaving stuff here in your apartment or whatever, you know, it might be a couple of weeks before we're back. So at that point, everybody thought like, oh, this would be a two week or a month thing. Well, lo and behold, months later, you know, so we tell these guys now that we'd only known for 10 weeks. And now at one point in quarantine, we've been in quarantine away from those guys for longer than we knew them in the first place. So good fucking luck getting your year one off to a good start and building those relationships it takes to be successful and laying down a base training and work capacity and all those things when you're totally apart, you know? And so now we're trying to find different ways to build relationships. We're trying to do stuff on social media. We're contacting our guys a couple times a week, every week, you know, and, and, and you get to the point where like, trust me, those kids are just as sick of Zoom as we were. Yet here we are Sunday, let's get on Zoom and talk. And these kids are like, man, coach, I'm good. Like, and, I, and in my mind, I'm like, me too, you know, but so, you know, then, you know, we try to, you know, trying to find ways to, sh- you know, let these guys know we care about them. So, you know, we got uh, all of our guys set up with like clean eats and they're getting like whatever it was, uh, 10 or 14 meals a week from clean eats. So then we're trying to do some nutrition at home. You know, we're down in the facility, you know, making, uh, you know, care packages of, you know, protein and electrolytes and bars and just everything we can possibly send them, just gutting out every bit of storage we have, trying to send them a box like every couple of weeks. So then at least they're trying to, you know, we're trying to give them as many resources as they can. 
you know, we're trying to work with guys on programming. You know, some guys, coach, I got nothing. I have absolutely nothing. I'm in my mom's house, and that's the end. You know, some guys, hey, you know, a guy down the street has a, has a garage gym. He has this. Some guys are like, hey, my coach has let me sneak in my high school gym at night. You know, so we had guys all over the board. So we're, we're working a lot of different, you know, variations of trying to find ways to keep those guys active and training and doing stuff, you know, as, as best we could over that time. You know, then you came back and, you know, you're still very much in the middle of it, especially especially in North Florida here. And uh, so now, like, hey, we're back, but it's it's voluntary because, you know, kids could be scared for their health. So they may or may not partake in this. And, you know, so you do your best you can through that. Then even your guys that want to be around, one kid tests positive. Now you got contact tracing because they all live together. They ride together. Their lockers are together. Their lives are together. So now that wipes out a big chunk of your guys. So now, even when we were in our summer program last year, when we were back to be mandatory, well, hell, you know, the, it, it's week one, but you're a kid that just got contact traced today. All right. So now your week one is beer bells is week three. Well, let's say you're a kid that's positive and you gotta go through the cardiac clearance and all the other things that come with that, that draws out. So you get some kids where week one is week five or a kid that was trained the first two weeks and then, you know, either uh, tested positive or got traced. Now they're back out. Now they're back in at the very end. So like it was, it was for us, I mean, it was literally like spinning your wheels and we were kind of just rerunning the same really, really, really basic program doing the best we could with the time we had and the guys we had. You know, and so that was that was that was tough. And just, you know, going through the season, I mean, hell, we, we had games canceled, you know, because of it. And you look at a You look at a guy in four years of college football. You know, you're talking about 12 regular season games. There's 48. You know, say you go to a bowl game every year. There's 52. And, you know, maybe you're lucky you sprinkle, sprinkle a conference championship game or a playoff game or something like that. But you're still talking a max of whatever 56, 57 games a kid could play in total in his college career forever. And now you lose two or three of them. Man, that's a, that's a that's a whole percentage of your career, you know. And for all the time and work and preparation you put into that, and just like that, it's gone. So now you're managing that, you know. And then the trying to share the information and this and that. It's it's, it's the stuff everybody went through in some form or another, just however it applied to your area of life, you know. But definitely tough for year one when you're trying to build relationships and build trust, and you don't get a chance to truly be together enough to have done that up front. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even I, this, and it's like I'm sitting here getting frustrated for you in that situation because yeah. you know when you're writing out the program, the the however long you write out at a time, it's like, oh my god, like we're dropping kids week one, week three, week five, they're all over the place. The, the Zoom calls, you're trying to organize training for a kid that only has his mom's three pound pink dumbbells, like it's it's a huge headache there. Was it the strangest year of your career up to this point? S strange, uh, frustrating. Uh, I mean, every, everything in between, everything in between. I mean, this was a year that, and then on top of that, you know, you throw in, you know, you can't bring recruits on campus. So now, you know, whatever, even in the winter program, we're kind of getting back to normal training guys doing our job. And so I come home on Tuesday and Thursday nights, but since we can't have recruits on campus, I got three or four hours of sitting in front of a computer like this doing, you know, our recruiting presentation via Zoom. Yeah. Because kids can't come to campus. So, you know, it just, it, it was a lot of compounding things, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it's tough, but like we came out pretty good, pretty good. Our guys, you know, for the most part <laughs> did a really good job on their own of trying to find ways to go out and be an athlete and do those things. We also had guys that the best thing they could do is P90X in the living room with their mom. And that's a real thing, you know, but uh, it, it's that's why going through the winter and now getting into the summer, man, is so exciting. because we're finally, finally starting to get like get our head above water a little bit with having got to spend time with the guys and, you know, build some belief in the program and in each other and eliminate all those distractions and all the bullshit that came with last year and just get back to doing what we do. And like, that's the, that's the, that's what's got, you know, everybody fired up right now, kids and staff included. I see. Yeah. I'm going to spin think every, everything. Um, yeah. Go ahead. A, Go ahead. Oh, no, I, I spin just, zone I'm going to spin it. You guys, you know, the, the people who went through all that, I mean, that just sounds like an incredibly difficult time. And, you know, even though it was like delayed, you know, um, there's like a bond for sure. Um, that's gotta be struck, you know, just for the people who went through it and now we're coming back. It's like, you finally get to all be there and do the stuff that, you know, you, you tried your best to, to do and, you know, it's with probably varying degrees of success. So that is, that's gotta be exciting, you know, just to a lot of delayed gratification. I guess I'll put it that way. 
Yeah, there's no there's no doubt. And what you what you hope to is with with with, with some of those guys, hope, hopefully hopefully a lot of the guys, but you know, it's never be a hundred percent, but like they see what the staff put into them when they were away when all we could do was what we could do. You know, and and hopefully that means something. You know, because that's why we do all that stuff. Because we're doing everything we do is to try to serve those guys. And you hope that that's not always unseen and you know, sometimes is like appreciated, like, man, that was that was that was a lot, you know. Because everybody's going through their own deal at that time. Yeah. Hell, I mean, you think about it like this: you're you're a college student. You're a you know, say you're an older college student. You know, you're a junior. You're a senior. You've been away from home for a long time. You go back home, and now you're in your mom's house for months. Like I know myself at that age, and I, I, I mean, my 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 parents are are awesome. But can you imagine you're used to being your own man, your own adult, doing your own thing? You go back home to see mom for spring break for a couple of days, and you're there there for three months. <sighs> Wolf, that's rough. That's rough. <laughs> so I think now with kind of the world going back to normal, resuming the things that we that we love to do, now we can kind of get back to the point where I can paint us kind of somewhat of a, a picture here of, you know, life is back to normal. We're out back. Maybe maybe we're crushing some beers with the lads. The 430 NFL slate is on. And I know, Coach Storms, that you are a lover of smoking meats, the fine art of smoking meats. So my question for you is, what meat do we have on the smoker? And what special tips and tricks are you employing to make sure that this is the most delectable cut that we have had? Mm. It depends. Let's just say it's a let's say it's a regular weekend, not a special occasion weekend. Probably would have done uh, like a a pork shoulder or pork butt. Mm. And if it's the 430 slate. I probably to put that thing in the day before, let it be overnight. Um, I like to I like to prep it. I like to prep it a day before I even get ready to cook it. So, you know, uh, you know, get it cleaned up, butchered up a little bit more if need be. Get that fat cap nice and scored. Get it rubbed. Get it rubbed up with mustard. Rubbed down with rubbed good. Wrap it back up. Let it live in the fridge for a day. Let that salt do its thing. And then you know, cold smoker, cold meat. Let that thing run for you know, you know. Got a few guys over. You're gonna you're going a big one in there, so you're probably talking twenty to twenty two hours, probably in there, nice and nice and low till that thing hits two oh three, and you can pull it out and you pull that bone out, and there's nothing left on it. You know you're in business. That's a man who's passionate about the meat, right there. I tried to paint a vivid <laughs> picture, yeah. and this guy's like, "I'll fucking show you a vivid picture here." Mona Lisa. Yeah. So now, as someone who is not a lover of a pizza pie i will let mike handle our final question i believe it's for our tally pie lovers yes yeah, for the locals yeah so um you're out you're out in tally um <clears throat> are we going with momos are we going with game street pies what's the uh what's the go-to here all right so i should probably ask you this because we hadn't been here what? very long right and then in there a little COVID, while then, i guess COVID, well, okay. well then COVID hits that takes a lot of time out so sure. uh I've had Gain Street Pies has been like our go-to, okay? Yeah. And Gain Street Pies is awesome. I'm also not going to say it's the best because the, every other place is like, oh, this is the best pizza here. This is the best pizza here. I've had none of them. So I only got one to go off of right now, and Gain Street treats us really well. But okay. today, we're going we're gonna to be able to branch out on this now, though. So my son uh, is allergic to dairy. And uh, like not like, oh, it makes my stomach hurt. I'm talking like full-blown, like – anaphylactic alert yes and uh so he uh just passed his food test today so he can start having you know dairy that has been cooked essentially so no just straight cheese straight milk things like that and uh but like you know things have been baked with dairy and whatnot well i didn't realize this but the the nurse told us like yeah like pizza whatever i'm like really so now now that we have to go out and explore pizza probably this weekend, this will be the first pizza he's ever had that isn't just pizza crust, sauce, and meat. Oh, man. So, yeah. So we're going to try to go out and blow minds this weekend. I just don't know where we're going yet. Wow. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, like, so I, I, Game Street Pies is really good. I've never actually been inside there. I've always ordered it to go or, like, to mm-hmm. deliver. Same. Um, Same. But Momo's is kind of cool on the inside. Um, they have a, a large variety of, uh, of beverages. Um, Excellent. The, yeah. So so that, that's really good. And also, like, the slices are huge. So that's kind of, like, pretty cool. I think if I was seven, I would really be interested in, like, the large slices. <laughs> What's going to happen, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it. He's going to, like, eat this pizza 
he's going to realize and be like, holy shit, I haven't had this my whole life. He's going to be like, I don't care about sports. I'm going to make pizza now. And yeah. Like I'm a, gonna pizza a, a dreams of sushi situation. He's just going to be like a, a pizza guy. Uh, but yeah, no, so that's, that'd be a good, that'd be well worth your time. Um, but, but yeah, I, mean, I think they're both, uh, they're both good. Um, awesome. We'll have to so, go check it out. We'll yeah, have to man. check it out. Yeah. All right. Well, but, Pizza Talk is as good of a place to finish as any. Is there anything you guys want to circle back to before we send this thing off into the sunset? I do not. Um, I just wanted to to thank you for coming on, Coach. Really appreciate it. My like uh, like nineteen year old self is like ecstatic at this. Uh, being able to sit down and chop it up with uh, head strength coach for FSU. So, I mean, I appreciate it and, you know, appreciate all that you're doing for the guys as well as just, you know, the field. You guys, you put out a lot of great content, um, great representative of the, uh, of the industry. So I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate that time, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad, fired up. You guys asked me, invited me to be on and uh, to be honest, sorry, it took so long to, to get it lined up to finally get on, but I'm glad we did though. Busy guy. No, I think it was, I think it was perfect timing with everything revving back up for the season coach. We, we really appreciate you coming on. The only thing that I ask is that you treat my boy Mackenzie Milton with nothing but love. He was our savior and he, he left us for greener pastures and we understand that Correct. we accept that we can move on. I'm not crying. You're crying <laughs> guys. Thanks for coming and watching. Thank you. Uh, as always, like, comment, subscribe, do that YouTube stuff that all the people say. Uh, go Florida State. Yep, Guys, stay gifted, and we will we see go. you on the next one. There we go. Yeah. Yes. There, we go. there it is. <laughs>